Hey, uh, we thought we'd talk you through a little bit different format. Uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit more about the past and what has happened uh, in past years. And uh, in particular, uh, I'm going to hopefully get a chance to convince you that the future is bright and exciting and that the government does have a little bit of a role in that future. If you look at the history of transportation systems, the government is of often involved in one form or another. Um, so, uh, but to start off, uh, I would like to tell uh, a little bit about Tom. Uh, Tom Ingersoll, uh, I, he didn't really work for me, uh, but he, he worked <laughs> for McDonnell well Douglas, out. and I was the government program manager for DCX when we were flying that, just out in the desert uh, a little over 20 years ago. Um, then I did go to work for him when he was uh, Universal Space Network and Universal Space Lines, along with Pete Conrad. And then uh, about three years into that, I went back to the government, decided my for front of my forehead was not flat enough, and I have flattened <laughs> it some more ever since. So um, Tom took the other route. He just chose to make a lot of money, and that's a great <laughs> way to go, Tom. Um, and I'm proud of you. I really am. And it's uh, one of the things about that DCX team. They scattered to the winds, and they're in a lot of these entrepreneurial companies. They're all getting a little old now, but they know <laughs> what they're talking about. So we're going to talk uh, a little bit about the past and then go on to the future. And in particular, we're going to talk about some of the people that made this happen that aren't here today. Next chart. Or do I flip something? Ah, okay. Um, DCX. Uh, you know, uh, George talked earlier today about those X vehicles in the 50s and 60s and, and the uh, future of aviation that they enable. And all that is absolutely true. Um, but DCX also did some interesting things. It was a seminal point where suddenly the entrepreneurial sector realized, hey, you know, we can do this with small teams of people. We can build and operate things. And a bunch of entrepreneurial companies followed on its heels. Most of them, I call them the barnstormers of the 21st century. Most of them ended up in the side of barns, okay? But there were another set of barnstormers that followed them. And, uh, and so what you see is uh, a lot of people chasing this thing, aircraft-like access to space. And aircraft-like doesn't mean it has wings. It means reliability, maintainability, supportability, availability, the ability to operate and fly something with very small teams. So, um, Tom, I got my own memories of DCX and the people that made it happen. But uh, I think you got a couple stories about Bill. Yeah, and, uh, thanks, Jess. I appreciate it, and Pat, for letting me just share a couple of thoughts. I, um, <clears throat> Bill Gobatz brought me on board the DCX program as, I think, the second person assigned to it to help write the proposal. Um, this was in 1990. Um, ideas were floating around. Um, but Bill was a true visionary. And uh, I think a couple of things that, that I learned from Bill, uh, I think they are instructive for all of us uh, as we go forward and provide a little bit of insight into Bill. Um, not only did I work for Bill on the DCX program, I worked with him on X33, and then after we both left McDonnell Douglas, Bill shared an office with me for, gosh, until about 2011. So we worked very close with Bill for many, many years, and I uh, have a very fond spot in my heart for Bill. In the, uh, but in the early days of the DCX program, we were this proposal team. We were trying to figure out what we were going to go do. Uh, it was really uh, some objectives, but really no, no de uh, detailed requirements. And um, so we're trying to decide, is this vehicle locks hydrogen? Hydrogen is a locks kerosene. People were throwing out you know, pero hydrogen peroxide, a lot of different, different concepts. And there was about maybe 14 or 15 of us working on the proposal at this time. And this gives you some idea of uh, Bill's uh, vision and leadership. So uh, he called us in on a Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Um, we're going to make some decisions, he said. So we all, you know, sadly, I guess, crawled into the, the conference room at McDonnell Douglas Corporation in Huntington Beach at, at 8 o'clock in the morning, and Bill said, okay, let's make this decision about what kind of propellant we're going to use and move forward. And he said, um, we're going to let everybody cast their vote. There's 15 in the room. Let's make a vote, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make, at the end of this meeting, we'll have a decision made. So Bill said, Bill said I'm last. So they went through this and we all sort of chimed in and I was all of 28 years old. I was mostly taking notes. Most of the people in the room were, were veterans of the industry and it was 14 people had cast their vote for LOX kerosene. That was a McDonnell Douglas Delta. We had the Delta rocket, That's, we had parts, we knew about it. And Bill said, that's great. Uh, let me give you my perspective. He said, I cast my vote for LOX hydrogen. My vote counts for 15, <laughs> it's LOX hydrogen. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was pretty classic Bill. I mean, Bill had a vision. Um, but he also had strong leadership, and he wasn't going to get a lot, of, a lot of details 
in the way of his vision. And I think that you know, one thing they said about, about um, Steve Jobs, that he sort of lived in this reality, his own sort of reality distortion field. And I think you could almost say that about Bill. Bill kind of had his own little reality distortion field that he had this extremely strong vision, and he was going to go make that vision happen. He respected the challenges around execution, but he also understood the need to, to pursue the vision. And Bill did a great job on that. And I think a tribute to Bill's leadership is that there were 15 of us in that room. We got outvoted. We all got outvoted by Bill, but we all supported Bill. And, and there's nobody that had, had hard feelings about that meeting. So Bill's really a great visionary, a great leader, and uh, one that's inspired not only, I think, his generation, but my generation as well. As, as uh, Jess said, there's many of us that are off doing entrepreneurial things uh, with varying degrees of success. So it's a great tribute to Bill. Great. Um, and I could tell you about Bill. Uh, Bill didn't worry too much about the details. He had that vision and he chased it. And uh, he was an amazing personality in terms of communicating that vision and, and getting people to follow him and getting the government to step up to the table as well. Um, about the time we got serious about building hardware though, uh, we did pull in some other people, and I tried to find a picture of Paul Clavat, uh, who was our actual hands-on Mr. Inside program manager. Um, uh, but um, Paul deserves a lot of credit for actually making the vehicle fly. And you probably know Paul better than I do. But, uh, uh, and we'd also like to talk about some of the other people on this chart. Uh, they are gone but not forgotten. Let me talk briefly about the top two, and then I'll let Tom talk. General Danny Graham was uh, head of High Frontier, a retired Army three-star. Absolutely, totally believed that the answer to future missile defense and a whole bunch of other things was in routine, rapid access to space, uh, as well as commercial exploitation. And of course, Pete Conrad, I remember Pete telling me, Apollo 12 and Skylab commander, that this was the first program he'd been on in a long time that really rang his bell. That's Navy talk, you know. So. Uh, uh, and um, I got to tell you some Pete stories, but before I do that, why don't you tell some? Well, I'll just a couple of stories that I think, again, illustrate leadership, illustrate uh, what it takes to be successful. There was a talk yesterday about <clears throat> rocket science hard, but entrepreneurship is harder. Uh, rocket science really is hard, and um, uh, we can talk about the dream and the vision, but there really has to be a, a, a great focus on execution. There's a great um, saying that I like and I use often, you'll hear me say it a lot, is that um, a vision without execution is hallucination. And um, I think that's absolutely true. And Bill, Bill got that. And so when you know, Bill knew that he was the visionary guy, and he brought Paul Clevat in uh, to go make this happen. Those of you that know Paul, Paul's about this tall and was tyrant, I guess, as some people would call him. But he, was, uh, he didn't mess around. And, um, and Paul went after excellence in everything that he did. And he was extremely demanding. Um, we talk about how much fun we had on the DCX. We also worked very, very hard, and we had an exceptional team. And I'll give you an example of how, how Paul sort of set that standard. I think it was the first uh, government review we had. Uh, Jess was a, a young major, and he had more hair, and there was less of him. Um, <laughs> there was more of me and, less ha and more hair then, but anyway. Um, so we were in this design review. I think it was our systems requirements review or something. And one of, the, one of the guys got up and started giving his presentation. And there was you know, 50, 60, 70 people in the room. And about a third of the way through the presentation, the guy made a couple of mistakes. And Paul said, uh, you know, that's not right. That's not right. So he corrected himself and went on. About two thirds of the way through the presentation, he made a couple more mistakes. Paul said, you're fired. Get out. I don't ever want to see you again. Leave. Leave now. And the guy started to continue on with his presentation. And Paul said, no, no, no. Leave. Now. Leave. You're out. And he was gone. It was his last day on the program. And all of us that were on that program knew, hey, we had to have our act together. We had to be involved in technical excellence, execution excellence, or we weren't going to be part of the team. And that created, you know, I'm not sure that's you know, a great example of leadership, but it did teach all of us that we had to have our act together. We had to have our A game on if we want to make this thing work. And taking a project, you know, four engines, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, um, going from contract signing to first flight in 18 months is, is not a trivial task. And it takes a very, very strong leader to make these kinds of things happen. And, uh, and Paul was that. He was a very, very strong leader. And, and I think that we sometimes under, underestimate the challenge of execution in this industry. It, it, is, it is hard to do. It has to be done well. Um, the other quick story I want to share about Pete. I, you know, I, gosh, I, I love Pete. He's like a, a, a second father to me. 
Um, I worked with Pete very, very closely until he passed away. Um, great loss. Pete was also very critical to the success of the DCX program, and I think he helps us understand the importance of cutting through red tape. I think that one of the key successes of DCX, and the reason we were successful, is that we were able to cut through endless amounts of government red tape. Um, I can tell you, I've sat in dozens of meetings with Pete, with flight safety, with ground safety, with every regulatory body imaginable, where we would sit down and explain. Usually I was the one having to explain it. I'd take all the arrows. I'd be sitting there explaining what we were going to go do and have them go, no, 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 you can't do that. And Pete would just sit there and listen. And after a couple of hours of me kind of getting beat up, Pete would kind of sit back and go, you know, when I went to the moon, we did it like this and this and this. And it certainly worked fine. Like for, it worked fine when we went to the moon. I don't see why that won't work here. And, you know, they would kind of look at us and... And then he said, you know, I, I've been flying commercial aircraft for the X number of years, and we fly hundreds of people around the world safely. We don't hurt anybody, and we do it just like this. I don't understand why it won't work here. And the very next day, we get approval to go do something that, uh, you know, a lot of these, these uh, safety and, and flight safety officers say we would never be able to do. But somebody who has the vision and who could sort of cut through that red tape was critical, and Pete was you know, visionary and ex extremely capable of doing that. The one last story I want to tell, you know, lots of stories you could tell about people on there is Bernie Theaters, um, kind of an unsung hero on the DCX program. Um, you know, I was all of, I think, 27, 28 when I started on the program. Bernie was 70. Um, and we were out trying to build a LOX hydrogen vehicle. We didn't have a whole lot of parts laying around, and we needed to fly soon. So we brought Bernie in to go find hardware. Bernie loved hardware. I think one of the speakers yesterday said that, it, that hard, hardware has its own little piece of, uh, of behavior and its own, its own personality, and that's absolutely true. So Bernie had a, had a cube next to mine, and I heard the phone call that he made one day to the Smithsonian. He called the Smithsonian and said, we need a couple of LOX hydrogen uh, relief valves. They're on the Apollo exhibit in a certain building. And the curator goes, no, 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 no. They're not there. It's all, you know, I've got the, the sheet in front of me. Those valves are not there. And Bernie goes, oh, yes, they are. I put them there. You go check. And I'm going to call you back tomorrow. The next day, Bernie calls him back. Sure enough, those valves were there. They were shipped on an airplane. We had them a week later. And, and, and things went off and happened. But Bernie was not an engineer. He was a technician and taught us the value of people who understand, live, and breathe hardware. Because yes, I agree with the comment made yesterday that we all want to fail digitally. That's the, that's the safe way to fail. But when it comes right down to it, we only succeed if the hardware succeeds, right? The hardware has to work. And we need people that, that understand, live, and breathe hardware. Bernie Theaters was one of those people and, and made a true difference. But everybody on that team was outstanding. Because if you weren't, Paul pulled your pin and you were gone. Jess, back to you. All right. Well, I, I, uh, I just got to tell one story on Pete Conrad. I got about 100 of them, but uh, uh, this one is uh, interesting and, and, uh, and indicates the kind of drive and, and the personality that he brought to the program. Uh, we, we attempted an a eight-hour turnaround on DCX, which, you know, sounds easy. I mean, we didn't fly that high. We were subsonic. But I keep telling the guys at NASA, at, and they never listen to me, that, you know, going faster is just a matter of putting more gas in the can and adding the thickness of the TPS. Uh, and that is true uh, to a large extent. I mean, we, all of the other subsystems we had uh, there. So, so we were trying to demonstrate an eight-hour turnaround, and we had a, this nasty monsoon uh, storm that came in, and we ended up doing a... a, a 26-hour turnaround time instead. Thank you, New Mexico weather. Um, <laughs> but uh, a couple days later, I get a phone call. I'm on the East Coast, Washington, D.C., from the uh, range manager, uh, Phil Aragon. This is 11 o'clock at night. He calls me, he wakes me up, because Pete is causing a revolution out here. You've got to stop him. And I go, what's going on? Well, Pete wants to fly three times in one day. We can't do that. <laughs> and I said, Phil? I'm a major in the United States Air Force, and you want me to call up the third guy to walk on the moon and tell him that he can't advocate that? You're crazy. <laughs> so, uh, but that excitement, that incentive, that desire to demonstrate aircraft-like operability really permeated the program. And, uh, and it at later filtered into a lot of the commercial industry that's out there, from x -Core to Mast and Space Systems to a lot of the barnstormers who aren't around anymore, and some of the future folks. So uh, a lot of interesting things going on in this industry uh, that are really exciting. Can you give me just one quick story about flight day one on DCX? Huh. Yeah, so uh, flight day one, DCX, we get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, 
You know, I love coming to Las Cruces. Uh, this morning as I got up, I could smell that, the desert air. Isn't that wonderful? I just love that scent. Oh, it's beautiful. We got up at you know, 4 o'clock in the morning, heading out to the Northrop Strip, killing I don't know how many jackrabbits and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, birds that would fly into the radiators of the car. It was kind of a, a, almost a game to see how many people you could get. But we got out there. We'd had a big thunderstorm the night before, and the facility was pretty much ruined. The, the covering over the Delta Clipper had, was broken. The doors was jammed. The trenches for, the, the, for fueling the systems were full of water. They were full of gypsum. They were dirty. And we kind of got there and go, you know, this isn't going to happen. And we had a little powwow. And Conrad says, you know what? I think maybe, you know, let's give it a shot. We, so we had Bernie Theaters. Pete was actually out there with a shovel um, cleaning stuff up. He got a rag. He got, he got dirty. And uh, we started cleaning stuff up. And come noon, it was about noon, I guess it was about noon, we were all pretty tired because it had been an early day, but you know, hey, we're kind of getting there. Uh, the people from, Wistif, from White Sands Missile Range had come out and pried open the, the covering for the, for the vehicle and towed it away, and you know, it was kind of coming together, and we're thinking, hey, maybe this will happen, and, and our, you know, no, it'll just keep going, we'll just get the day done, and then we'll decide. About two hours later, it became clear, hey, we could pull this off. And uh, I think Jess was there, and there was a high-level meeting, it was like, do we really try, try and do this? There's a lot of tired people. And they said, hey, let's go with it. Go for it. Yeah, I think we went around the room, and uh, Pete was the last one to speak. And he said, you know, um, the facility's a mess, but the vehicle's in the best shape it's ever going to be in. And so we flew, and uh, it flew well. We did have a little nose cone fire, but, you know, that was OK. It That's worked just, out. <laughs> just the parachute. We'd already yeah, landed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And, um, but, but a remarkable testament to the leadership that Jess provided, the leadership that Bill provided. Bill was obviously there, obviously there pushing us forward. And Pete was the one who had to go make it happen. He was our, our flight manager and kind of a testament to the team, working from really, it, at the beginning of the day, we just felt like we were probably down for weeks. And uh, just everybody chipping in, um, able to make it happen. So we did take something away from that, and that is you will never find a member of the DCX team advocating the typical space solution of a mobile hangar that you move <laughs> over the vehicle. That, that hangar was rated to over 100 mile per hour winds, and it was in bad shape. In bad so shape. Um, uh, from here on out, we all talk about using a real hangar and moving the vehicle back and forth and minimizing your time on the pad. And guess what that sounds like? An airplane. So, um, so that was uh, some of the people that have passed, and I'm going to walk through some of this. I'll ask you a few questions as we Fire go ahead. through. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the future from a government perspective. Sorry about that. Um, U.S. launch in the early 90s, we were spending around half a billion dollars a year on, def on Defense Department launch systems. Today, we're spending over $3 billion a year, and it's growing rapidly. So we have a huge problem. Um, uh, even for small payloads, uh, if we were to modify a Minotaur, you're typically talking over $50 million a launch to put 3,000 pounds to orbit. Uh, there's foreign competitors out there who've pretty well taken away our commercial market. There's new, new, no surge capability, long call up times, typically greater than two years. And our budgets in this era are continuing to decline, and the threats to air and space assets are continuing to grow. So. Some of the systems, both foreign, U.S., uh, Elon systems, some of the small launchers are all on the chart. Um, what the DARPA leadership said was, let's attack the cost problem. And so we have two programs that are addressing that. One is Experimental Space Plane-1 on the right side of this chart. And the other is ALASA, Airborne Launch Assist Space Access, which is putting a small expendable rocket on top of, or on the bottom of an F-15 and throwing it to orbit with some novel propellants and chemistry uh, to make that work. Uh, what I like about the combination of the two is the ones working the low-cost expendable technology. I'm working the high-speed reusable technology. And obviously, to go to orbit, I need a low-cost expendable at some point. So it's really a perfect marriage of technology that will help us push this industry forward. Um, so our, our, uh, our vision, of course, is to break that cycle of escalating safe systems costs. And the objectives over on the right, uh, reusable first stage, fly 10 times in 10 days, fly to Mach 10 at least once, uh, launch a demo payload to orbit, and design the system to be able to put up uh, three to 5,000 pounds at a tenth the cost of a Minotaur IV, $5 million a flight. 
So that's the goals that we've put out there. They are aggressive goals. Uh, some of them are softer than others, and uh, we'll nail them down in, in concrete when we move into the next phase of the program. But right now, we're in the design phase, going through preliminary design review, and it is a fast-track design process. We, we plan to be at PDR next spring. The program just started in July. Uh, we'll go through this phase one. We actually have uh, three main airframe contractors and about seven or eight technology efforts that are going on. We'll uh, down-select in 16. And, and, uh, and go build and fabricate and fly a vehicle if, uh, if all goes well. Uh, again, who we're working with is the Boeing Company, working with Blue Origin, Northrop Grumman, working with Virgin Galactic, and Maston Space Systems, working with XCOR. So you notice some interesting marriages here, uh, and also the careful word, uh, wording, working with. Um, sometimes I'm not sure who's in charge of what, uh, but clearly the private sector, in many cases, has more money available to chase some of this stuff than the government does. So we are trying to build a military, a, a, a capability that would be useful to the military, but do it on the backs of commercial space. Because if we can do that, you have a sustainable solution. If we can't, uh, then we're just another space program. We also had some interesting technology awards. Uh, and, and I gotta tell you, since the early 90s, the technology base has radically changed. It's far more mature than it was. Um, Honeywell is doing some uh, trajectory. Uh, Gloria Taylor Labs building lightweight composite tanks, a little small company. Armstrong, NASA, and they're not the only one. A number of NASA centers are working on critical technologies that support this type of vehicle in the future. Um, but they're working on something called fiber optics, uh, sensor systems. Uh, SAS uh, is working on some uh, oxidizer-rich stage combustion and next-gen rocket activity. Uh, ATK is doing uh, thermal protection systems, as long as CCAT also working on thermal protection systems. Orbitech working on a next-generation rocket engine. And we have uh, another award that just went out to uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne that's doing an additive manufactured uh, thrust chamber assembly, low cost. Uh, quick to build uh, engine and uh, space based comm range award that's upcoming in the future. So, so we've got a number of activities going on in this program. We have tried to reach out to the commercial sector that's doing useful and interesting things for us and loop them into the program wherever we can. We obviously don't have infinite uh, resources so we can't help as much as we'd like. A uh, little bit about the history. This isn't a new idea. Space planes have been around forever. We've been talking about them forever in the military and NASA and other places. What's different is the technology is starting to change and the technology is starting to get much more mature. So some of the past programs, Shuttle, NASP, Venture Star, you remember all those? Been to this movie before, what's different? Well, let's talk about that for just a minute. Th these past programs were trying to do single stage to orbit, or they were trying to make scramjets work where rockets might have been okay, or they're trying to do heavy lift payloads, or they're putting crew on it where maybe they don't need crew. Um, and in every one of those cases, if you look at what we call the technology maturity level of each of those systems when they started their program, it was pretty, uh, pretty low on a, what we call a technology and readiness level scale. It was in the two, three range for most of these systems, uh, maybe just a little higher in a few areas. Um, really tough to do that. And so what has changed is you sit there and go around the list of technologies from structures to uh, avionics to engines to uh, uh, aircraft-like operations to propellant tanks. We're sitting at TRL-5, which is typically the level you want to be at before you do a flight demo, uh, across the board. And so we're in a much better position to really be able to chase this thing called aircraft-like access today. Um, and the technology would enable this three to 5,000 pound payload capability. We're trying to bring the cost down by an order of magnitude in the early years. But in the farther term, the technology would also introduce uh, hypersonic, be introduced to hypersonic aircraft and potentially to sortie vehicles that can fly anywhere in the world in, uh, in a matter of minutes from continental United States. So it gets very interesting in terms of what you could do and starts to enable that uh, high frontier vision that Danny Graham had so many years ago. Um, so uh, what are we trying to do here? We're really trying to take the step beyond where we finished DCX so many years ago. 
We're trying to push the mock capability up. We use 10, but you know, it might be less than that. Um, it'll depend on, the, uh, on what the industry concepts come back with. Uh, but uh, I would point out that the X15 stopped at 6.8 a number of years ago, and we do think that you want to continue pushing. Uh, we want to engage uh, FAA and DOD, and we're working very closely with George's office and uh, anticipate him being a, he and his office being an integral team member as we move ahead with this program. We're trying to leverage the commercial sector to the best of our ability in two ways. One, we're trying to um, use their technology where they have technologies that are useful to us, but equally important, we're trying to show that we can transition this technology back to the commercial sector in the future. Um, and in some cases, that'll be easy to do. In other cases, it'll be a little harder. But we're trying to avoid the venture star trap of everything's proprietary and we can't share anything. So we're not going to do that. Transition uh, vendor and subcontractor, it, again, vendor, subcontractor technology, transitioning it is easy. Some of the system prime technology is a little harder to transition. Uh, and of course, we'd like to see a, a launch capability come out of this program. Uh, it's clearly where we'd like to go. 3,000 pounds is big enough to be scalable to any size you want to do in the future. It's scalable to a fully reusable system to orbit, which could do military missions, but every bit as important could really enable this whole idea of uh, commercial orbital transportation. Um, and there's some side benefits, like we are flying routinely through the hypersonic environments, so we can potentially do hypersonic testing. There's even talk of point-to-point -point transportation across the globe. Very interesting capabilities, uh, hard to do, but the technologies might help enable it. So, um, so we're uh, interested in talking more and understanding how this type of capability would uh, transition into the future, and I would certainly love to talk to you all. We also have a little... Uh, session going on tomorrow morning that Kelly Girardi's running where we're going to try and get inputs from the commercial uh, industry back to where we ought to be going with this program to help incentivize the industry. I would like to ask you, Tom, commercial space, is it time? I mean, uh, you're the expert on commercial <laughs> financing now. Uh, well, <clears throat> I think that it's something that's time. We're definitely at an inflection point, let's put it that way. Um, I think I'm on a panel this afternoon. I've raised $150 million of venture and, and private equity for commercial ventures. Um, and I think what's, what's unique now is that there's a, a return on investment history. And that's really what's key, is that you've got folks now that have, traditional investors have gone in and have made investments in space-related activities, and they're actually getting a, a, a viable and meaningful return on that investment. And that's going to catalyze a lot of additional investment as we go forward. So I think, that's, I think we're at an inflection point, and as I preach whenever I have a chance to talk, it's really about execution. You know, I think we're, we get to decide whether we're at an inflection point up or down um, based on how well we execute and how, we would how well we deliver on the, the, the investment that's made in, in, in us. Right. And I uh, have to show you my favorite chart for those of you who are still doubting Thomas's out there. Um, well, this is just a summary chart. It says we're going to do what I just told you. So my final chart is uh, final thought. Uh, from the uh, 1903, October 9th edition of the New York Times, a flying machine which will really fly might be evolved by the combined and continuous efforts of mathematicians and mechanicians in from 1 million to 10 million years. The best minds in the country told us that, and we knew it was true. From Orville and Wilbur Wright's diary, October 9th, 1903, we started assembly today. So the best ideas about the future are going to come out of the minds of people. And he wasn't the front runner. Sam Langley was the front runner uh, to introduce flight to this nation. Um, so, uh, and Sam Langley lost, although he did get a center named after it down <laughs> at, uh, in Virginia. So uh, we, uh, we thank you very much for having us up here. Uh, we'll be around for a while. Any questions? So, gentlemen, we do have time for a couple of questions from the audience. The first one being XS1, why now? After some 50 years of research, why the program now? Well, because we didn't do it 20 years ago when we should have. <laughs> um, I, I think that the, the reason is we're trying to, uh, we have a huge problem in the Defense Department with escalating cost of, of space systems. I mean, it, it, it goes far beyond launch because all those launch costs are also driving satellite costs and it's a vicious cycle. 
So uh, we clearly need to find ways to bring costs down. And Elon Musk is doing a wonderful job. One of my favorite people in the world is Elon at SpaceX. Um, but you know, you want a competitive industry in the future, not just one solution. And so we really want to come in and show that you can build these technologies and with forethought build them to introduce reusable systems. A little hard to fly aluminum at Mach 10 and expect it to be reusable unless you fly it under very carefully controlled circumstances. And I got to give Elon credit, he has found the way with the rocket back boost solution that he's going after. So. Well, along those lines, follow-up question, what is the funding status of, of XS1? Well, XS1 is funded through phase one and we'll make a decision next year. Uh, we are uh, a lot of uh, excitement at DARPA. Our program director, uh, Arthi Prabhakar, uh, Dr. Prabhakar, has been very supportive of this. Our deputy director has been very supportive, and my, uh, my office director and, and deputy director have been supportive as well. So uh, we'll, uh, obviously, we, we take a look at everything we have to do and what the priorities are with everything going on in the world. Uh, you never can tell. Uh, if Ebola breaks out tomorrow, it might be a different pro answer, but right now, we're looking pretty good. Great. Excellent. Gentlemen, thank you so much yep. for your time. God bless. Thank you.